Welcome, spectacular agents and investors nationwide. Today is Thursday, August 26, 2021, and this is Mastermind Podcast number 342. Uh, anything, um, Bruce, we'll go around the horn before we get started. We do have one person in the queue. Thank you, Kyle, in the queue. We do have room for more. Just hit star six and then hit one. Bruce, anything you want to share before we get started? I only have one thing to say, and, and that is, uh, Jim, you you um, brag about changing your adjective around whenever you um, start these calls, yep. and I'm pretty sure that I've I've heard spectacular a number of times before. I was going to say the same nope. thing. I just didn't want to break his heart. You are yeah. incorrect. Since you guys called no, me on that, sure. I have – all right. Well, since I've been keeping track, which is the last 53 calls, it has not been one of them, maybe prior to that. Ah. But but yeah, it's only since you guys called me on it, so we won't have any. We won't repeat them more than once a year. How's that? So do you have fifty three <laughs> that you that you can rotate through? No, no, I'm gonna keep them going. I'll never I'll never duplicate them again. But I just started keeping track when Tim mentioned yeah, right. that one day. Yeah, right. I did. I, yeah, you can. I did. Other, other I did. Languages. What's that? You're gonna say get it again. Having to use other languages at some point. Hola, senor y senoritas. Yes, we'll come up with – welcome to our Bueno Mastermind call. I have, to, I have to get Mastermind translated. All right, enough nonsense. Do you have any serious announcements, no, Bruce? No. Okay. No, do you have anything you'd like to share? Yes, actually, I do have one thing to share. First off, uh, as you may or may not be aware, we kicked off a little mini incentive program at the end of last week. and. I caught some flack from from a few people that uh, were foolishly on vacation through the weekend and didn't uh, get the email in time. And we had kind of said, if you don't let us know something by close of business on Friday of last week, you can't qualify for the promotion. And I always hate getting emails from other people that say, oh, we made a mistake. We, you know, everybody didn't get this. I mean, we're real, we're very careful to make sure all of our stuff gets out the way it's supposed to get out, but I didn't take into consideration that legitimately we may have people that didn't get the opportunity to do it. So first off, I'm going to tell you verbally that if you didn't qualify and you wanted to call us and ask if we'd consider uh, extending the promotion for you and you just didn't bother, feel free to do that You know, by the end of the week here and we'll be happy to talk with you and, and do that. And we're going to probably put it out again and run it through the end of the month so that I don't have people angry. And if if I wasn't doing it legitimately, I wouldn't do it. We don't send out things that we supposedly made a mistake just to get your attention again. But uh, we are going to uh, allow that promotion to continue a little bit. So that was the only thing I was going to have to say. And uh, we'll be we'll give you a little more leeway next time we do something. We don't do very many promotions, but we did do this one. And uh, we want to give you the opportunity to take advantage of it because it is they are the best prices that we've ever put out there for anything, particularly in terms of adding a county and all that. So forgive me for my uh, my stupidity. No problem. We're used to it by now. Oh, sorry. I couldn't resist that. Uh, all right. So we have one person in the queue. We got plenty of room for more, guys. Just hit star six. Hit one. You can be next up. In the meantime, our first caller this week is phone number ending in 5575. You're up first. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, it's Kyle Dempsey here from Atlanta. Uh, hey, Kyle. I went through, what's up, guys? Uh, I went through foundations a couple of weeks ago with with uh, Bruce, um, which was excellent. Um, I do have a quick question, though. As far as the – I'm making some calls right now, and I'm trying to figure out once I, um, once I parlay the conversation into, uh, you know, asking about the real estate, and I ask them if there is real estate, and if so, are they planning on, you know, are they thinking about potentially selling it, or are they thinking about hanging on to it? Um, I have some wholesale experience. I've done a few deals, but I'm not an agent. My wife's a, a new agent. She hasn't done any deals, but uh, we're just, I'm just trying to figure out how to segue, I guess is a better word, um, into, you know, whether or not they are, are going to be a retail seller or they're open to the wholesale. As far as wholesaling goes, I know that I need to come in and, you know, ask them what their timeline is, right? Ask them, um, 
you know, what the condition of it is, of the property is in. Could you tell me, if, you know, how Bruce explained it was it was like four or five different ways to kind of, um, you know, do the do the do the uh, Hurley he or whatever it is, the Saturday Night Live thing where you kind of edge your way yeah. in. Oh, would it be okay if I drove by? Are you open to an offer? You know, is it okay if I drive by? Is anybody is it vacant? You know, is it vacant? Is somebody going to be there? Blah blah blah. You know those and those small those small commitments from them. But as far as on the retail side, I, and, I, and I blame this on me not having sales experience in real estate, as far as from from an agent's um, perspective. What's the best way to kind of feel that out? Because I know a lot of people are going to want to list right now, but I'm trying to figure out how you know I want to get out there. I want to drive by the property. I want to get some info from them. But how do I as an eight as a an investor who's my partner and my wife is an agent, how do I kind of segue into, well, look, this is what we do as far as the real estate side. You know, we can list it for top dollar. We can buy it quick for cash. And they're probably going to be thinking, well, so you're an agent and you also buy houses. You know what I mean? Like they're going to, I'm just foreseeing some, some confusion about that from their, from their side. Mm -hmm. Um. So, you know, I, I'm probably not even going to drive home the point of uh, – I'm not going to pick a side until I know a little bit more about them. And okay. that way I can sort of still lay out a couple of different options when we meet or when we get deeper into that conversation. But there's going to be one that I, I pretty much know that is going to is going to suit them better. And it's, it's basically going to start like this after – we're, we're talking about the house. Uh, you know, you found out that they're potentially open to an offer. Um, the question then becomes, um, do you think, uh, do you think um, kind of a, a quick as is um, offer is better for you? Or would you guys rather do a little bit bigger um, or go a little bit more aggressive and try to list the house for top dollar? Nice. And you, um, up until that question, you probably don't know that, and uh, and they don't know. And now their answer is, well, it needs some work, or yeah, we're we're tired of dealing with it. It's full of junk. Um, we we want to just get out of it. Now you don't even have to drive for the the point of uh, of listing. You could mention it, but you could say it sounds to me like uh, like I'll probably just make you a, a quick offer, right? Or let me just double check. You don't want to fix it up and list, right? Okay. So now they don't have to fix it up to list it, though, right? Because as is sales on on the retail market are a thing. Am I, am I correct in saying that? Oh, totally. Yeah. But if if it's going to be as is and somebody's going to be getting an as is price, why not be you? Why not let it be you? Right. And they're going to have to pay commissions on that if they were to go through an agent the traditional way versus mm-hmm. wholesaling. It'd be potentially well maybe not quicker but they wouldn't have to pay those commissions so that could be a that could be a uh, benefit i guess from from the cash sale obviously that's right okay cool i just wasn't sure about that because i know we mentioned i know you mentioned in uh foundations kind of like uh um asking them if it would be okay if, if they said that they were open to selling or there was real estate or maybe you know hey would you be okay with you know would it be okay if I sent you over uh, over an offer? So mm-hmm. I was talking to Dave Pinnell, and, and he kind of we kind of discussed that that was uh, that could almost pigeonhole you if you just go for that approach because they may, you know, what I mean, I don't want to I don't want to cut off that retail that retail option, and I don't yeah. you know just kind of kind of kind of tricky there a little bit. So I've tested. Yeah, that Chuck. Question. Go, go ahead, ahead Bruce. go ahead, Jim. I've, t- I've no, tested I was just... that question. Time, many times before that question is um, if you say would you be open to seeing what I could do for you or would you be open to seeing what I could sell your house for or listed or uh, none of those work the same as would you be open to an offer if I sent you one because for all they know your offer might be full retail value for all they know your offer is going to be to list the house So I don't think it pigeonholes you at all, or at least in my experience asking that question, it doesn't pigeonhole me. It gives me an opportunity to craft an offer um, to list sometimes. Sometimes it gives me an opportunity, a wholesale offer or a cash as is flip offer or a a creative financing deal. 
Uh, you're just asking that question only because it gets a, a more favorable response than, than asking it any other way. Okay. Cool. Tim, you had a comment too? Yep. Yeah, you wanted to add, Tim? Yeah, I wanted to, you had said you'd ask a question about the as is. And the, the point I was going to make there is that if somebody tells you the place needs repairs, you never want to miss the opportunity to let them tell you what it needs. And the, the challenge with just saying, well, yeah, as is, is a sale, it is, but it can also limit to who you can sell it for because somebody's got to be, first off, be willing to buy it, maybe potentially be a, a, a high cash buyer. The challenge with as is, if, for example, if it needs, and we're seeing this a lot in Florida, they're playing the, it needs a roof, it needs an air conditioner game on almost everything that's going on around here. And, if you find that that's happening, they're not going to be able to get it paper. They won't be able to finance it on an as-is basis because either you're going to have to put a lot more money down to get it done or otherwise. And it, you, if you do that, you're it's like in a used car. You know, somebody brings a used car in. You'll always see a used car appraiser is going to walk around that car and find every little ding and, and uh, scratch on the car. You want to give them the opportunity to talk a good bit about what it might need, and that way they'll have some concept of what they're going to do with it. It also helps you help adjust the price. But anytime somebody says it needs work, make sure you dig a little deeper. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, and I was just going to um, add to that, Kyle, uh, a couple things. I think we've talked about this before. Probably the single biggest mistake both realtors and investors make is they go in either wearing one hat or assuming that the customer wants you to wear a particular hat. Uh, pro realistically, probably 80 to 85 percent of these are going to be listings, and the other 10, 15 percent are going to be flips. But but I would never assume either. You know, if you're if you're an investor and you assume they don't want an offer, you're going to come across that way. If you're a realtor and you assume they want to get top dollar, you you, you may be incorrect if you go in with that assumption. And um, I like Bruce's question. I I also just kind of like to start with a general uh, statement in question. You know, I I deal with hundreds of people in your situation, and I find out everybody's situation is a little bit different. I'm just curious so that I know, you know, how I can help you. What's more important to you, the, the time or the money? And, you know, well, what do you mean? Well, what's more important to you, a quick sale or getting top dollar? Give them the two extremes, and um, sometimes they'll they'll choose the in-between. Well, I'm not sure. Can you give me both options? But usually, usually they will choose one or the other. If you ask them an open-ended question like that, it'll either be like like Tim was just saying, oh, no, the house is in, you know, we, we, needs way too much work for somebody to get a mortgage. We want to sell it quick. Or we got to get mom died. We got to get dad in a nursing home. We need the funds right away. We can't afford to list it. Um, right. or, they may, or they may say, no, hey, there's eight of us and – we need every dollar we can get because when we split up the money, there's not going to be much there. They'll, they'll you if you just ask one open-ended question like that, uh, or give them an opportunity, like Bruce said, to answer your question. You know, even if you state it a little bit differently, they'll usually volunteer. I would say 90% of the time, I, I I find they volunteer enough information with that one or two questions that you can eliminate one of the options. <laughs> so so then right. you kind of know which hat which hat to put on or which direction to head in. You follow me? Perfect. Thank you so much. Absolutely. That really fills in okay. the gap there for me. Yes. Awesome. Well, we have no one else in the queue. Is there anything else we could help you with? Or, Bruce, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, man, you know. Or Chuck. Kyle, man, we, or Chuck. Yeah, Chuck, do you have anything? Um, so I, I really, um, yeah. I really am a, a big believer in kind of baby stepping people into these appointments because we don't know what they're doing and and they don't know. Uh, I don't find I'm just going to go back and and repeat that I don't find that asking someone if they're open to an offer pigeonholes you. Your offer could literally mean anything. And most people are going to say, if you phrase it that right way, well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'd be open to one. I just had a conversation with someone yesterday that the question was, would you be open to an offer? And his answer was, well, yeah, I guess I'd be open to one. I hadn't really thought about selling. 
Well, that's that's a, a wide open door for me. It might not turn into business, but he didn't turn me down. And most people just aren't going to turn you down if they're at all open. If they're close to it, they're going to turn you down, but they're going to turn down the listing appointment as well. They're going to turn really right. anything down if they're completely closed off to it. So asking that, that question. And and I, I want to know how the um, Hurley boy approach is going for you. Well, I'm just uh, I'm just going back through the foundations, and I, I watched the video again, the Hurley Heat Boy, <laughs> Hurley Heat Boy video again, and it's really fun. You know, it's really funny, but it's uh, I mean, it's it's such a better way to ease into it. I mean, it, and you guys' whole approach is, you know, is almost that that approach, that Hurley Heat Boy approach, because it's just easing in. It's like versus calling vacants or uh, you know. I don't call expires, but you know we've called vacants and not occupied. And I mean, you know these guys are these guys are shutting you down. You know, with the probate with this approach, um, it, it's just so much gentler. I mean, everybody I call is nice. You know, I've had some people call. You know, or some people answer the phone and say, "Oh, you know, I haven't had anybody call and approach me this way." You know, and <laughs> and with the depth that you guys are teaching it and foundations and you know that Chad and uh, you know and Jim and everybody else has taught it. It's just so much. Uh, it's just so gentle, man. I mean, it, it's almost. You know, I probably I haven't called I haven't called thousands of people, but I've you know I've probably hit a list of a hundred or two hundred, and it's nobody nobody has really chomped you know shot me down. They they're kind of like, yeah, this is this is Victoria. Can I help you? You know, they'll kind of come at you like that. But once you tell them what you're doing, and you know, it's it's just it's just smooth, man. I mean, that's kind of off point, but uh, yeah. No, I, I think Kyle, I'm. I'm I'm actually glad you mentioned that because we try to drill that home when agents start. Some of our more seasoned agents that that do call FISBOs and expireds, they kind of come in with a predetermined attitude that they're going to get the same grief from these people. They almost call expecting it. Like, you know, they, they're a little defensive, you know, they're, it, yeah. don't say, I'm sorry to bother you. Or And we try to drill home that don't make that assumption. It, it A vast majority of our, of our people, I mean, there's still a significant, it's not as much as when we first started because probate has become more popular, but we still get a significant portion that tell us you know, it's probably a minority, but a percentage tell us when they call, they're the only one calling. But even in the most aggressive markets, you know, there might be a dozen agents calling, but it's not hundreds like this, those and expired. So whatever level of rejection you've experienced with this, those and expired, don't come in with that attitude that you're going to experience that with these leads, because regardless of your market, that's really good to hear. And it just kind of proves that point that, you know, even if somebody's gotten a dozen phone calls over the last few weeks, you know, they're, it, it's it's nowhere near the resistance that other lead sources have. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. It's uh, I think it's a good point for people starting out making their calls to, to remind them and tell them don't go in with any assumptions. Absolutely. And if you guys haven't yep. went through foundations, everybody, everybody listen, if you haven't went through foundations, definitely go through it. It's short, but very, very fun. Yeah, come so. Week. Coming up next week, next Wednesday and Thursday. No, it's short but sweet, hey, right? <laughs> hey, we have two more hey, in the guys, queue. Was that is, Chuck? Was that Chuck? Yeah, this is me. I just wanted to add in that really, when I mean, you're you're calling people with the opportunity to help them, right? And you don't know their story yet. So asking those open-ended questions, say, hey, we've got a number of options here on how we can handle that. Can you tell me more about what would be the ideal outcome for you? And let's see if we can't help you get to where you want to go. And having that, having that mindset, I think Jim said it very, very well. Don't go in predetermined. And, but have that singular mindset predetermined that you're there to help. And by leading with that, your, your tone, your approach, will be received. I mean, people will feel that on the call. So by taking that approach, hey, we've got options here. Let's dig in a little deeper or tell me more about what would be an ideal outcome for you and find that, find what is your unique way of of speaking it because you can't be Bruce, you can't be Chuck, you can't be Jim, you're gonna be Kyle. So you've gotta make it your own as well. 
Yeah. Well, well said, Chuck. You know, one of my original mentors years ago, and and I've I've remembered this over the years. It's important what you say, but it's far more important how you say it. And how you say something is determined by the assumptions and the attitudes you go in with. So you know, start with start with your attitude. Start with uh, open assumptions and. Regardless of what you're going to say, uh, it's I, I. When I was in college, I sold books door to door. They used to tell us if you knock on a hundred doors, you could throw up and somebody's going to like it. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, if, if you have a good if you have a good attitude, and that that's an extreme example, but but it really does matter less what you say than how you say it. If you if you haven't taken any NLP courses or you know communication courses, it, it, that's the whole essence of those things. It's it the words give you confidence and scripts give you confidence, but it's how you say them far more important than what you say. And Bruce is going to teach you what to say. So you so you've got that down. Sometimes the only missing ingredient is how you say it, which is based on your attitude going in. So I, I guess we beat that yeah. to death. But <laughs> yeah, the NLP. Go ahead. Uh, Bruce mentioned the NLP and the uh, foundations, and I think it was a good. It was my introduction to it, but it was very uh, it was very bite sized and easy to comprehend for a. Uh, um, you know, a guy like me. So I appreciate that. One, sure. more, one more thing, guys, before y'all cut me off. Um, sure. My wife, since my wife is an agent. She, uh, she's a full-time pharmacist, but she did just get her, uh, her license as what her uh, agent license as well. So she hasn't had a lot of time to invest in it, but, um, to get to my point, um, I'm doing most of the calls. So how can I kind of spend that if someone does, uh, you know, is open to an appointment and, you know, they actually will be there if I go by the house and, if they are open to a listing versus, you know, I, I pretty much have the wholesale side handled. Um, but as far as listing, how do I, how would I kind of pass the torch to her, or even present present it if that if our conversation on the phone does go that route? How do I present that, and how would I pass the torch to her, you know, in your yep. y'all y'all's opinion? So my wife and I are business partners, and um, she can't on Thursday, unfortunately, but um, we're going to review everything and come with a couple of different options for you. Um, if you guys choose an option where maybe you go with the listing route, um, it would be her that kind of takes it from that point. And if um, if you all want to sell it to uh, me or want to do something creative to help um, help get you guys a, a little bit better deal for you, then, uh, then I'll handle that. Nice. And people will will love it. I mean, you just kind of tell them the way that you're going to do business. And if you're confident right. with it, you're going to accept it. You were cold. And I think that's, cold. A, that's a, Bruce. <laughs> what? I, I think it's real it's important to also understand that people like to be led and they're looking for guidance to say, once they present, Hey, this is the best outcome for me. They're looking for your leadership. So what you say, they will follow. Right. And there's a really good term that you should kind of fit into your conversation. And it's, it's something that would go something like this, which is that, well, obviously I deal with a lot of people. And most people that are in circumstances similar to the one that you find yourself in are, are looking at this as an option. And that's a great way to lead back to what Judge just said is that, you know, you're not now you're telling them what you want to do. And you're saying that, you know, a lot of the people that I work with can't successfully are doing it this way. And it's what you want them to do anyway. And if you're approaching this in the way that we teach you and that Bruce is teaching you is that, you know, you're approaching it with the idea of you really are trying to help them <clears throat> give them the right answer. Uh, they will follow what you tell them to do if you're good at doing it. The only other thing I was going to say is that, you know, if your wife is, is doing this and learning how to do it, uh, taking your wife with you occasionally on what you're doing and seeing what people have to say, you're helping her learn how to do her business, and that would be good. And I'd also carry around a pre-filled uh, listing agreement in my, in my uh, stuff I haul around to meet people with. If the opportunity comes up and she's not there, you can at least get them started on the paperwork. But, you know, you've got a great team there. You need to build that team up. Great advice. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, we have two more in the queue, guys. we got plenty of room for more. Just hit star six and hit one. 
In the meantime, next up is phone number ending in 8512. You're up next. Hey, how you doing, guys? Uh, I'm over here in uh, lovely uh, Ventura County, California, very high price and uh, also very competitive out here. I had a couple of questions. Uh, uh, I think I was saying I'm, I, I have a pretty uh, well automated system with KV Core that I, I use texts with uh, on on the other stuff with Fizbo. So I was thinking of incorporating that. So when you send out a text, and I, I don't think I would ever send it to a DNC person, but the, the ones that aren't, uh, how how would you how would you open a text? I was thinking of starting off like you know sorry to bother you kind of thing, or is that just just get right into it. Hi, I'm so and so. How would you open your text? Get right. Don't into apologize. It. To start with. Yep. Go ahead. Pardon? We we're going to thing, but go ahead, Tim. Uh, you were going to answer it, but I would say never start by apologizing. You're not apologizing. You're offering him something of value. Don't apologize. Don't ever start that way. Okay. And Bruce, go ahead and finish what you were going to say, bud. Um, it, it needs to be pretty short. The um, I'm sorry to bother you. You know, you if I look at a text that starts like that and I just see that little preview window on my text, then maybe I'm unique because I have 300 and some unread text messages on my phone and pretty much all the 300 start, hey, I'm sorry to bother you. And I, oh, oh <laughs> salesperson, uh, I don't need to read, I don't need to open this and read the rest. So you want to jump right in. Hi, this is. First name, uh, don't don't get too wordy. First name, um, writing you about uh, the estate of or writing you about um, a property address or probate. One of those three things. You just want to kind of get straight into it. Um, I do X, Y, and Z. Keep it short. Uh, would you happen to have any interest in discussing um, my my services? And by the way, I don't do any text, so I was kind of making that up on the spot. <laughs> but if I rethink of, of something a little bit, yeah, later, I was, I'll bring it next. <laughs> I was I was going to add also that um, what we hear back from our subscribers, I haven't really texted texted either, um, but we hear from our subscribers that particularly when they're communicating with with attorneys, that. They in the subject line, they'll make it look like an official correspondence, and we've had a couple of people tell us that works pretty well with the executors also. Just in the subject line, something like regarding probate case number 75203 or regarding the probate located at 123 Main Street. Just put, put that and nothing else in the, tech, in the subject line, um, ah. especially for the – yeah, because it makes it look like some kind of official correspondence that they think they may want to open up and respond to. We've heard that we've heard that works very well for emails, and um, we had a, a gentleman a couple months ago that told us that was working well for executors also. So the, the, you got to get it opened. So put something in the subject line that's going to get their attention, and let them know yeah. that you know. Let them know you're not, you know, make them give the impression that it's an official correspondence for the case. And uh, and then, you know, then go to the copy that Bruce said. But if they if they they much better uh, chance that they open it than if they don't. You know, it's all about open rates with text and emails. Oh, I love Makes that. Sense. I love that official thing. That's that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, you mentioned okay. something that was going to be my second question. So it kind of goes right into it was what? And I know that every, you know, court system is different and everything, but what, what are some good ways of finding property addresses? Are you a subscriber of ours right now or not? Yeah. Okay. I know that, you know, so, it has, it has, it'll have the, it'll have the deceased name and address, but I don't know if that's necessarily the property because I've, I've no, seen it, quite a few cases it, where I know it's not the property, so. Right. It's not necessarily, probably 70, 70, 75% of the time it is. We do, um, and, and I'll let Bruce and Tim add, we do have an enhanced service called Probate Plus where we will give you, it is an extra charge per lead, we will give you names, address, assess value, uh, real estate owned by the executor, you know, or the uh, the deceased, I'm sorry, anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. Um 
that's a nice service if you're getting hundreds of leads and you want to narrow down call the ones with property first. Um, as a typical rule of thumb, though, we recommend contact everybody because you just never know. You just never know yeah. what business is going to come come from it. Tim or Bruce, you want to add um, any other well, way to find I'll the property? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll add one thing. I didn't want to clear this up, and that is that we don't we don't automatically have that data and we're holding it out on you. If you want it, then what we do is there are several additional steps that we have to go through with your leads to go do that, which is to take them, run them against the tax law, uh, tax records, run them against MLS. There's a bunch of physical work to do it. So we will do it, but it's additional cost only because it's not what we normally do. And right now, I'd say maybe 20, 25% of our folks do avail themselves of that service. But like Jim said, frequently they're in, in the larger markets and they really want to focus their efforts on, you know, really for sure knowing where a property is. The one thing I'll also tell you that even our best efforts at doing that, uh, if we're hitting 80, 85%, we're doing really well. And the, the thing that Jim said about calling everybody, just because they don't have the house to sell in that, I can't tell you the number of folks who've gotten on our calls and will tell us, well, I did call them. They didn't have a house to sell, but you know what? Here's what happened. And they end up telling us a story about, you know, something else that came out of that. And what it is, it's an opportunity to talk to somebody, tell them what you do for a living, if nothing else. And those are great opportunities. And you just, you know, if you've got the time, got the energy, I don't know the total count of leads that you're getting in Ventura, but, um, you know, I'd suggest trying to reach out and get to all of them if you can and be prepared that if there isn't anything there, remember that you have a lot of services that you can offer and keep asking questions. Do you know anybody that, you know, in, in that, have you, where do you live? Are you looking to move? I mean, a good salesman is always going to start asking questions until they get the hint that somebody's really tired of talking to them, but you're developing that relationship. It's a great opportunity to move forward. Yeah, the most extreme example I can remember of that, it was probably a year or so ago, we had a gentleman, it was in California, I think it might have been in San Diego, but um, he reached out, yeah, it was. and the, what's that? Yeah, it was, that was the one I was thinking about. Yeah, and, and but, but the conversation went something like, oh, no, I'm sorry, you know, my, my uncle, he was very wealthy, but um, he sold his real estate before he passed away, um, and the agent would say, oh, okay, thank you, and he goes, oh, by the way, he said, I... The guy had inherited so much money, he had like a $700,000 house he wanted to sell that he had already owned, and he had his eye on like a $2.5 million house he wanted to buy. He said, could you help me with those? <laughs> <laughs> so don't assume, that, <laughs> yeah, don't assume that just because there's no real estate in the estate, you remember, you're still talking to someone yeah. who who may have inherited a significant amount of money and they may want to sell their house and move up. Uh, you know, they may want to buy investment property. So um, that's a, that's why we've always said the best practice, if you have the time and bandwidth, is just call everybody. And like we were saying earlier, don't assume anything. Just assume that there might be a way you could help them regardless of, you know, whether there was real estate in the estate or not. Yeah, actually, I was just thinking I just wanted the address, like, for the purposes of the text, like you were saying, you know, regarding the property at so-and-so address. But I guess you really can't go wrong with a probate case number, you know, so. Sure. Probably not. Yep. Well, goal. depending on your additional approach, so let's um, let's say that you're doing a mail campaign in addition to your calls. And let's hypothetically say that you're doing four or more mailing touches to that person uh, or to each lead, then you you really should be doing Probate Plus. And the, the guys, that's one of the services that um, I go out of my way to kind of sell on if somebody's doing an extensive mail campaign in addition to their phone calls, because identifying which properties there probably were in the estate um, will kind of let you <laughs> I'd hate to go. I'm not going against what Jim just said, but but it does allow you to cut 20, 25 percent of your leads out of your mail campaign, and and therefore save that mailing cost. And and oh, kind of that's that's letters. interesting. It's pretty much where you'll get your um, hit your break even point, and then any any additional mail that you do on top of your fourth mail, it's really a savings at that point. Um, 
so if you're doing mail. I, I, I okay, do yeah, if you, if you could just explain how it works, because I figured that the mail was just going to go out, and then the probate plus would just give you info after that. So you're saying that the probate plus, you get that information, and then you can tell, uh, like I got Michaela or whatever, don't, you know, mail just to so-and-so people, that then how it would work? So, yeah, it's made into your, into your portal. Yep, right into your portal. And you want to have Michaela put maybe a um, three to five day. I wouldn't let it be too much longer than that, but just a long enough delay on your um, on your automatic mail so that you can oh. go in and tell the people that you don't want that mail to go to. Oh, okay. you know, it could so do a three to five. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Three to five delay. It just what occurred to me, it's like a lot of things. You could do a blended approach. You could, you could, you know, not mail to the ones that don't appear to have any real estate, but call everybody, and you could send more letters to the ones that do have real estate. And it, uh, Bruce is a big fan of not stopping at three letters. You know, doing four or five or six. So. If you cut out the 25% that don't have real estate, don't send them any letters. You've got more bandwidth, send more letters to the people that do have real estate. And that just because you're not mailing to them doesn't mean you can't call everybody. So you can kind of, you know, you can kind of blend. You, you got to play around with your market and see what works for you and what you have the time right. and budget for. But, but it doesn't have to be either or. You could use a blended approach for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll ask her. Yeah, that sounds good. I think, I think I was already thinking about doing uh, more than I'm doing four and I, I, mm -hmm. I thinking of spreading them out longer, you know, or having the campaign go longer, you know, so I was already thinking yeah, that. Sure. So here's the, that big would be yeah, the, pro the problem that would with the calls is it just takes so long and I'm also calling attorneys. So I, I probably would not call the people without property, just me personally, but that's just me. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. And here's the here's the big thing going back to mail. Um, we've taught for many years kind of a three or four um, touch approach on mail. And I've been um, in the market actually doing mail and phone calls for, for quite a few years. And in, in larger markets, take take a take a California market, take a, a market like I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, take some of the larger markets, um, excluding those rural markets, and there's enough competition now. To where three mail, uh, three mail pieces, and sometimes even four, only blends in. Especially if it's three letters or four letters, they're going to get three or four letters from ten other people in some markets. So yeah. if you want your stand apart and separate you, it needs to either be more frequent or longer lasting. So four touches, I think, is a little bit of a waste of money. Um, it's not. It's not like it won't get a result. It will get a result, but it's just not a predictable result. I think the predictable comes once you are starting to get into that six touch campaign. Yeah. Okay. And and then well, how far apart do you think? Um, generally, every um, two to three weeks in the beginning. Um, I I often alternate between letters and postcards in the very beginning. And then uh, as I get further into the campaign and as I know my competitors start to drop out of, uh, out of their campaigns, which is typically at the end of about two months, sometimes three, um, as I know that my competition starts to drop, I might do it every third or fourth week at that point. And I'll just let that run for, for at least six or seven months. Okay. Well, that's, that makes sense. I was doing every three weeks, but only but only four. So, yep. excellent. Good, good, good approach. So you're going more frequent than your competitors, and not that much more frequent, but uh, but you're going a little bit more. Frequent. Uh, I would now just work on trying to extend it out a little bit at a time. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I had a debate. Uh, was, <laughs> my wife was an executor, so I. I asked her. I had a debate about the uh, the address, uh, the return address. What, what's your opinion on the return address on the on the letters, on the envelopes? First, first letter, very first letter, put a, a return address on there. That way, as Tim mentioned, um, we're giving good data, but it's still skip traced. And if you skip trace me, you find a house that I lived in three years ago in a different state. So it's still skip traced. So 
I'm going to put it, put the data that's about 90% accurate. Tim went a little lower, said 80, 85. But I want to know which ones bounce. And so I put a return address on the first. And then that way I can take those people out of my mail campaign once I get that four or five or one or two uh, letters back. If you're in a big market, when you get that 12 letters back, you know you can take them out of your campaign. Oh, I, I, I was actually thinking more psychologically, like – she said that if she got a letter and it didn't have a return address, she wouldn't even open it because she thought it'd be scammy or something. That's what I was scared. Okay. talking about. With that. Well, it doesn't put a virus on your computer if you open a letter without a return address on it. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I, I've never – I haven't really heard anyone else say that. I, I, I don't feel that way, but that doesn't mean that I'm the, the norm. Mm-hmm. So maybe, All right, Tim you, Tim, you had something you wanted to add? Well, what was the – say that again about – what was the question about – Oh, yeah. Were... I think, Bruce, you said that uh, Tim had referenced 80 or 85 percent. I think that – I think he was referencing the accuracy of whether there's real estate or not, because I think on the mail delivery, we're about 98 percent or better. I don't oh, I yeah. don't think he was – yeah. yeah. So I think uh, it was yeah, apples and oranges, I think. Yeah, I was referring to probate plus and the accuracy of that with there are some false positives that come out that will indicate that there is, in fact, property and we find an address. And it's like what what, uh, you know, Bruce said is that it's someplace that you previous the person previously lived or it's a similar name in a similar geography that looks like it's probably theirs. <clears throat> excuse me, theirs and it isn't. But we we run everything. Sorry, excuse me. We run every single address that we do through a deliverability uh, system that's – we're a U.S. Postal Service partner, and we run it not only through their their databases, but we literally subscribe to two other services to make sure that when it goes out our door, it's 100% deliverable when it goes out the door. Now, that doesn't mean that in the 30 days prior to that, somebody didn't move, uh, close down the post office or the uh, – mailbox and put a sign on it, making it undeliverable. But to the very best of our possible knowledge or anybody else's, it's deliverable. And you can be assured that if we put a stamp on it and send it out the door, 99 times out of 100, it's going to get into somebody's mailbox. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Yeah, so, I haven't okay. had, I had oh. too many times. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. All thanks. right. Thank Pretty you. Good. Next up, we All have right. two more in the queue. Next up is phone number ending in 6640. You're up next. Hey, guys. Uh, Eric Basket here in Los Angeles. Um, hey, Eric. Good, I guess, afternoon for you guys. <laughs> um, yes, sir. So here again, I've, uh, I, I think you guys are 100% correct. Uh, calling these people is a lot easier than calling expireds and uh, for sale by owners. Um, I agree. I, I've had – my struggles have been – um, when I've been, I was doing the mail outs, I've sent out about 18 separate mail outs, I've had little, I've had maybe two return phone calls of, we don't need your services. Um, I just had your marketing department create these flyers and a few of the brochures. Um, I'm going to print some of them myself and have you guys still mail them. But my question for you is, I got the script from you guys last time. It was I was calling because I work with families going through probate. You know, I sent you a brochure last week, and I'm not sure if you had a chance to review it. Did you? Well, I never sent the brochure, number one, so I'm going to start sending the brochure. But it works really well. But my question for you is, is you know, I, I know I can only get so many people on the phone, and I feel like that's, for me, the best resource. And I heard you guys talk to the last caller, you know, you guys are going pretty hard um, in the first two to three weeks, you know, with letters. Because I know, what, I mean, a lot of these people are like, I have a stack of mail, All right? And they're like, well, I haven't had a chance to look at whatever you sent. I, I want to get this thing going a little bit better on the mail side. Um, so my question is, should I just stick with abnormal type of like mail pieces, like maybe go with a jumbo size postcard, something that's going to stand out from everybody, or I mean, what? What are your thoughts? Because I'm getting good calls on the on good return. Like people are answering the phone, but the mail side, I feel like I'm missing still a large part of the the people out there. 
let me let me take a quick shot at that to start with because we're we're the part of this that does the mail. So the the big postcard potentially can help you. The problem with that is it's for sure advertising. So what sometimes will happen is that people literally take their mail, they take it out of the mailbox, think about what you might do with it. You might kind of drop it all together in one, you know, put your hands together, drop it all down and whatever's sticking out, you'll probably grab that from the top and pull it off and look at the letters that came out. And that may be the way you organize your mail. And it, it kind of goes with everything else that we say. Put yourself in the position of who's going to receive it and what they're doing. So eventually they will they may get through everything else, but they're going to probably first look at things that are in envelopes. So assuming that's the case, you really need to do something that's going to make your envelope stand out. And I'm assuming you're you are we we're doing your mail, right? Is that correct? Yeah, you guys have been doing it. I feel like I need to reorganize. I get it. I get it. Order. So one thing one thing that we are seeing people having some some success with doing is to take the uh, on the outside of the envelope uh, either regarding putting on it regarding the estate of colon Joe Smith Sally Jones. It literally identifies it as potentially something they almost have to open because if they are the personal representative, if it's in a number 10 envelope and it's got that address on it and says regarding the estate of, they're going to open that because typically as the PR, that's their job. You know, it it potentially is somebody who's got a lien against the estate, some question about the estate or whatever. And that's something that's pretty sure to get open. So you might want to try that. The other thing you may want to try is doing an insert into the letter. And we have a number of things that we can put into it, uh, a magnet, a what, any, anything. We call it lumpy mail. And it, anything that you put in there that gives it volume, that when they pick it up, that envelope's in their hand, oh, there's something in here. I wonder what this is. They're going to open it. They're going to want to see what it is. It can be the simplest thing in the world, but it gives it a little bit of volume. And we know the thickness and size of the things that you can put in to go do that. So if you'll talk to the, the whoever you're working with uh, on your mail and suggest that, you know, you want to break it up a little bit and maybe add something different to it, send them one thing one time, send them something completely different the next time, uh, you're going to get these open. The postcard is a good thing for something to keep around. And if, you, if you're going to do four or five or six, like Bruce is talking about, then it's certainly yeah. a good thing to go do because they'll hold on to it. But I would say if you're going to do less than four or four, I would I would stick with the envelopes and break them up. Like I said, do a piece of lumpy mail, do a, a, a number 10 envelope with a regarding the estate of that sort of thing. And we can certainly help you with all that. Okay. And I'm going to jump in there and talk to your, your reference of a postcard and my reference to postcards. A postcard is not to deliver content. Um, And a a postcard, its primary purpose is to give an extra brand impression. It's a little bit cheaper, unless unless it's jumbo, then it's not. But it's a little bit cheaper. It doesn't need to lay out a bunch of content, doesn't need to describe your services. It's, it's a brand touch. And it's a brand touch for someone who should, um, at that point, kind of at least know who you are, and it's just to keep you relevant. So it's not always the best first thing to go out. Brand touches right. don't work on day. They work over time. So I use postcards because I'm going six months, and I just want to break apart that mail a little bit so i've got some content pieces going out that are making an offer i have some content pieces going out that are educating and then i have some postcards that are just a brand touch to kind of keep my name fresh in their mind so if you're using postcards um, just make sure that it's it's in a longer campaign otherwise it's probably a waste of money yeah my goal is to do seven touches i just I, i think i need to rework it um but can I ask you guys one other question on my process and get your opinion on it? Sure. All right. So I uh, I just got a fresh list. I think it was like two days ago. Um, I do the uh, I do the searching where you guys um, probate plus. I do that, 
And then I export all the properties that are all the ones that have properties into Mojo and all the, all the phone numbers and I call through, okay, before I mail anything out. And I actually use that script of, you know, I send you a brochure, even though I didn't, but it works. Um, and then after that, we'll go into uh, the ATL website and kind of I'll go into the, uh, the lead and I'll go through at the bottom and I'll remove them from things if they, you know, one, either have already sold the property or I don't feel like it's going to work out. Um, and that's been my process. What do you think about it? Because I find calling through the ATL website by itself is very tedious. And I just find Mojo is just a, a much quicker way to just dial three numbers at a time. Anything so, I should add to that? Or... <laughs> uh, Jim, Tim, do you guys have anything? Because I, 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 um, I call through Mojo. Um, no, no issue with that. It depends on the number of leads. And being able to call three numbers at a time is always powerful. Um, you've got to pay attention to your, your drop rate, um, which would probably be relatively low, but you do have to pay attention to that drop rate. If you, if you're, if one of your lines hangs up on someone, you're probably not going to get them back. Yeah. So sort of the, uh, the seven touches reference, do, do put a brochure. If you're going to, if you're going to say that you're sending a brochure or you sent one, um, you don't want someone to call BS on you. So to mix that in yeah. <laughs> and then, and then those calls, absolutely. You know, we're calling every second week, um, especially in those early days. If, if I could call more often then I would, so I'm calling uh, every two weeks though. And then I might space it out later and later in the month, but keep, keep the calls going. I may have misunderstood your question because everything you said kind of uh, mirrored what uh, what I do in my market. You know, it, if you don't have anything to add, I would just, is let, can I ask you what kind of voicemail drop do you guys leave? Ah, yes. Um, so voice drop number one is typically generic. Um, those of you that don't have a dialer, if anyone doesn't have a dialer, you're not going to drop a message, but you, you custom record it each time. But if you're using like Mojo uh, Drop, um, first one's going to be pretty generic. Um, hey, it's Bruce. Um, giving you a quick call because I shot you that, that brochure in the mail last week. Didn't know if you got it. Could you give me a call back? Um, from that point forward, if they haven't responded, they kind of proved to me on that first call, maybe the, maybe the first or second call, they proved to me that they're probably not going to call out of curiosity. And at that point, I need my voice messages to be an extension of my brand. So it start and, and it, an extension, more importantly, of my USP. So I start to leave detail in my voicemails. So they would be something uh, along the lines of, uh, hey, this is Bruce. I'm giving you a call. I don't want to be a bother. I, I called you a few weeks ago. Um, have a service that helps families through probate. We basically act like a concierge um, for anything that you might need during that process, whether it's um, the white collar stuff or the blue collar stuff. Um, we could help with uh, just a bunch of different things. Could you call me back? And, and then maybe the next time I get, go into detail on a specific service and maybe a different service the next time. And so I try to vary it up to where if they're getting a few messages from me every month, that it's not the same message over and over again. It's it's always a little bit of a variation in there. Awesome. And then toward the awesome. end, I go very real estate focused. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Last up this week is phone number ending in 4357. You're up last. Hi, good afternoon, guys. This is uh, Bob Warburton. I am in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and um, had a couple questions. Uh, Bruce has been helping me. I've been uh, using the service for with your uh, virtual assistant or ISA, I guess, as you realtors call them. Um, so <laughs> we started off with um, call tools, and, and Bruce is very aware of what I was doing, and that was kind of a that did not work out so well. It was blowing through the numbers and um, you know like very quickly since we you know I'd have like 150 numbers or 100 numbers. Um, and then the other problem was that 
we weren't able to like update the notes. And if you had three phone numbers for the same person, we're dialing them all together. So I, sw- I switched over to Ring Central, and we're just doing a manual dial where, where my VA will copy the phone number and paste it in and, and, and do and, and call. And we're not entering any data into the dialer. She just has the uh, all the leads website, and we're using that. Uh, as the CRM, in essence, to put the notes and follow up. It's a little bit slower. We're getting about 130-some calls and a day in a four-hour call period, about 10 to 15 conversations. But it, I, I, I don't know how else you'd be able to do follow-ups and look at notes because what I've, ch- I've trained my VA is to, you know, look at the notes and set a follow-up calendar date and, you know, see who we're look, talking to, who did you talk to, what was the last conversation. Um, it seems to be working a little bit better. So I'm not sure whoever's using, I think, Bruce, you said you're still using Mojo, how how you can accomplish that. Maybe on the first dial, use a triple dialer. But how can you, uh, you know, if you can kind of give me some input on what you think, I don't know how you'd be able to do that if you can't see the notes. Well, it's, uh, it's, um fair to say that I'm running both um, both models now. So, you know, we have um, some of the, the VAs that are calling manually like you, like you. I'm using Mojo. The ones that, uh, the ones that use Mojo really have to take um, a, a solid um, 10 minutes at the beginning of their call session and a good 15 to 20 minutes at the end. And at that point, take their um, conversations and put them into notes in uh, ATL. So if you're using Mojo, you're going to get through more calls, but you have to uh, be prepared to probably lose a half hour each day and, uh, and and transcribe those notes over into ATL and then take 10 minutes at the beginning and, uh, and make sure that, um, and make sure that you're, uh, only calling people that are due for a follow-up. So it's a little bit more tedious uh, on the setup, but you're still getting through calls a little bit faster. And you and I, Bob, have discussed um, the pros and cons of that. There are pros and cons to both approaches. It looks to me like your uh, your your approach is working pretty well. I would just stick with what you're doing is calling right out of the yeah. LCRM. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out how you would you would have to upload a new list every single day to go back in and look at each list. Yep. And I've got eight, and I'm only in one market. So if you had multiple markets, you'd have to upload every single time. So what I've trained my VA to do is just go in and start at the most recent, go all the way through to the to the January when I started, and then just recycle. But she's looking at the notes. Uh, each time, and we ha- we kind of made a joke about how they're, you know, she's actually really starting to, you know, not just randomly call numbers like a cold caller, just look at the notes. Oh, I spoke to him last, you know, he hung up and said he wasn't interested. So she's learning to, you know, follow up, set a task in a month. So, yeah, I don't know how you would, you would have to, man, you would have to upload a new list every single day, I would think, to, to look for when to recall people, correct? Um, you do, and we have some people that are actually splitting their list out, and so they're loading different numbers in as a different lead altogether. But your your approach, um, I, I mentioned Mojo because some people just want a dialer. They want to get through calls faster. They have huge lists, which you have a pretty big list too. Um, yeah, the, decent size. I, I, um, would, I would just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, I think I will. Okay. Um, also, you had mentioned in an email about I'm using Ring Central. It was like fifty or sixty bucks. You mentioned Line Two dot com. Is that, is that working okay with you? Uh, it's working amazing. Um, I'm gonna give credit where credit due. Is Tim told me to told me about Line Two about a year and a half ago when I had it on my phone for a year and a half, and finally revisited it about three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, and it works brilliantly. Works great, just like. Uh, not Ring Central has uh, more functionality, but it has a lot of wasted functionality for me because I'm only calling. I'm not using their webinar functions. I'm not using their video functions or email or anything like that. We're just calling, and that's all you're doing. Line two for 15 bucks a month is is a great solution. 
a lot cheaper. Can you record calls? Yes, um, that's not available on the $15 plan. I think you have to be on a 25 for that. Still cheaper. Do you think that's worthwhile to record the calls? Yeah. yeah unless you have someone who you 100% trust what they're saying. And, and I would say, and I know who your um, ISA is, I, I would say that she's getting pretty pretty close to saying the right things most of the time. But I do think it, I think that that call recording function for a little while is, is a benefit. You could always downgrade later when you know exactly what they're saying. With, with Bruce, as a part of the training, are you reviewing calls with them, Go look, listening to calls at all, or should I, is that just on my end? Uh, it's, all, it's all of it. It's all, yeah, we're, we're um, listening to calls. The VA program or the ISA program is still new enough to where um, we're adding different pieces of coaching and training in for the ISAs. But, um, but yeah, we're reviewing calls. Um, we're uh, we're implementing one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions um, per week here very, very soon. So um, it's it's only getting better and better. I don't want you. To, I don't want to kind of brush off your question. Um, the the real answer is that um, is that we're improving the the ISA service. There are some things that um, that still need to be worked on. And uh, I need more time to listen to calls, but we are listening to their calls if they have recording on there. On there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess I'll I'll switch over to that and get that and just inform you and inform her, so you can mm -hmm. listen to them. But I uh, no, I'm I'm pleased. She's doing a pretty good job. Um, so I I was doing my mailings in a mail house because I could save a couple bucks. But I have found, just to kind of give a shout out to the people there at all the leads, I have integrated uh, to using the mail. Uh, and one of the reasons is because my, my mail service won't mail 112 letters. You know, they have like a 200 minimum, so I can do that. Plus, if we eliminate the lead completely just by selecting no real estate and, and just with a you know, quick checkbox, it eliminates calls, mailings, emails, probate plus in the future. So just keeping everything inside the the uh, CRM at all the leads websites working out pretty good. I'll tell you, if you could have a if you could put a dialer in there, so you could do multiple dialing, and it would still pop up the screen of the of the account. Boy, that would be really cool. But um, my last quick point, I know we're over over the hour, is um, I'm getting a lot of false positives on my uh, probate plus. And I'm seeing some of them, if they live in a nursing home, that address is pulling up where, you know, because you'll have hundreds of people in there. And it shows, like, every time that's in that one particular retirement community or nursing home, it shows that the owner, the, the deceased owns, like, 27 properties because there's all these other <laughs> properties. So I am seeing quite a bit, but at least I can – what I'm doing is a little bit of a hack, and I think I told Bruce, is what I'll do is I'll pull the spreadsheet – and and put the the deceased's uh, address and the um, the the owner the property at, uh, or excuse me the deceased's name put it in a column right next to the owner's names the owner owner one and owner two and then kind of scrub that for duplicates in an Excel spreadsheet and if the last names match I keep it in there and if they don't I remove them from from mailings and from letters, because that means that the owner's name is different from the deceased. So that's helped out a lot. But I do see a, a decent amount of false false positives. Um, yeah, that's so actually a very that's a very clever hack there. I, Tim had to go; he had a two o'clock appointment. Um, but I know that's probably the one bug in Probate Plus, and and I think Tim usually just tells people it's pretty safe to assume that virtually nobody owns 25 properties at the same address, so just discount those. But I like your, I like your hack there. I'm going to tell him to listen to that, and uh, maybe that is something we could do to, to hack that. That's probably the – from my understanding, that's probably the biggest source of incorrect information, and it's very, very difficult to scrub that out because it yeah, does appear yeah. – you know, it does appear like they own them all. I would so, get excited. That, I tell you, I would, get, I would get excited and see, oh, my gosh, I got 25 <laughs> properties – I'm, this, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a yacht now. I'm gonna buy all these houses. <laughs> but, yeah, good so good hack, that. though. I like I like it. It's yeah. a good suggestion. I'll pass it on. 
and then I have a, 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 my, one of my own, own in-house VAs go in and, and then just uh, check it off. It, to me, I know people earlier said about you can call and offer other services, but I'm, I'm an investor. I'm not a realtor. So if they don't have real estate, I don't, uh, you know, I want to get to the, I'd rather make 10 calls and send 10 letters or six letters, whatever, to people that I know they got real estate and pare it down and then have my sure. VA just concentrate on those and put my dollars uh, into mailings mm-hmm. those. So other than that, everything else Perfect. is pretty good and, I, um, and the mailings are going well. So thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. We I appreciate everybody for being here today. I appreciate your patience. We ran over considerably. Uh, another great call. I want to challenge each of you. Take one idea, one thought, one thing that inspired you on this call. Go out and put it into practice, and please come back next Thursday and share your results with the group. Have a great week, everybody. Talk to you same time next Thursday.